Well, uh, let's uh, get started. I want to welcome you this morning um, to our research conversations. And today we have Dr. Virginia Clinton LaSalle here, and she has a tremendous amount of expertise in quantitative methods. And you will be reading an article from her um, in this module um, specifically around fixed design. And today, Dr. Clinton Lazell is going to be talking to us about her own research, but uh, specifically about um, um, experimentation. So I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Clinton Lazell introduce herself briefly, and then we'll jump into some questions. So thanks for visiting with me today, Virginia, and a brief bio would be great. Sure. Uh, so my name is Virginia Clinton LaSalle. I'm an associate professor in educational foundations and research. Uh, my background is I have a PhD in educational psychology uh, with a focus on learning and cognition. As far as my methodological expertise, I am an experimentalist and I also um, have expertise in research syntheses, specifically meta analyses. Uh, as far as content areas, my area is uh, digital reading and open education. Thank you for the bio. Welcome today. I know our students are going to be excited to hear specifically from you after they've read your article. So let me open up our first question, a couple, a couple of real quick questions to go through. The first question is, because you're experimentalists, I'd love to hear from you what you think the strength and limitations are of experimentation. Yes, well, the idea with conducting an experiment is you have randomization, and that means that you can isolate one particular treatment or experience that students or other people may have um, and have a group that has a different experience. And with randomization, the idea is those groups should be statistically equivalent or comparable in terms of age, gender, uh, previous educational experience, motivation, the amount of sleep they got, you name it. So anything that would affect how they would perform on whatever measure of learning or whatever assessment you have, it should be, as far as the individual characteristics, it should be the same in both groups or approximately the same. And the idea with an experiment is you can see if this one particular idea that you have or intervention or characteristic, if it makes <coughs> a meaningful difference on the outcome. In other words, if you vary the lever here, will you see a wiggling of the effect over here that corresponds? That's a great, that's a great example for um, the strengths of experimentation. What are the limitations or the lim limitations for experimentation? You can only analyze what you measure. So with an experiment, you're, you know, you have all numerical data for the most part. So you don't have any opportunities for participants to really share their experiments or experience with the experiment. Um, experimentalists have learned over the years that actually maybe it would be a good idea to ask people who participate um, at the end, like, what did you think? Do you have any feedbacks? Can you share anything about your ideas with that? Because otherwise, if an experiment didn't work, we'd be like shrugging our shoulders and um, on to the next one without really using any rich insights that, that the participants would be able to provide us. Thank you. So it's a very top-down approach. It's the researcher changing things for the participants um, with a lot without an opportunity until the end to get feedback from them. That's great. And that's um, very helpful for um, our students who are just learning about fixed design and specifically just potentially learning about experimentation. And so having that kind of balance of knowing strengths and weaknesses or strengths and limitations is really helpful. Um, then I want to move us into your article because all of the students in um, my class have been reading about um, fixed design and has all, have also read your article. And if you don't mind using your article as an example, could sure. you just give like one or two threats to validity that specifically mm -hmm. relate to your study since they've all read your study? All right. Well, I would say probably the two biggest ones are one selection bias. So when students uh, participated in my study, so this one was all college students at UND, in the description of the study, they knew they'd be reading it. So you're gonna have some selection bias. We're gonna have people coming in with a certain level of motivation to read. 
uh, because they chose the reading study over a study on forensic psychology to look at crime photos or something like that. So that's one threat to validity is this is extend to people who would rather clean the bathroom than read a book. Another threat to validity I wanted to highlight is what's called ecological validity. This was in a controlled setting. They were monitored uh, by the experimenter. And they, what's particularly noteworthy with this study is with the iPads that they were using, the internet access was turned off. So it wasn't like reading from pretty much every other electronic device that the students would have at their disposal. They weren't getting text alerts. They weren't getting notifications from the school, from their email, from their mom, you name it. It was a very, um, you know, it was a very controlled setting. And that's really helpful. Um, it's helpful to understand um, those limitations and those threats to the validity and a really specific example from your article. So thank you. I appreciate that. That, um, And I know the students will have a probably a better sense now of uh, those <laughs> different types of internal, you know, internal threats to validity in terms of, of, of your study. So um, I want to talk to this maybe generally just for the last two questions about you being a quantitative researcher. And yes. so um, because, you know, again, um, this group of students is being introduced to quantitative and qualitative. And so mm -hmm. as a, you know, identified yourself as a quantitative researcher, yeah. where is the first place you start? Um, when you think um, you want to start a study, you want to construct a study, where do you first begin? So I would say it's probably pretty similar to qualitative in that you, you have an inkling or a curiosity uh, that um, develops both by your experiences in the world and also with your reading of the literature. You know, you'll read a study and then perhaps become curious based on what they found, wondering if there's a way you could address a problem they noticed or if you could better understand a problem they noticed. So in this particular study, what got one reason I got the idea is that I had conducted a meta-analysis comparing reading from paper and screens. And to be honest, I, from a theoretical standpoint, expected no difference because theoretically there really shouldn't be. It's reading. Uh, but there was. There was a benefit of paper. So that made me really interested in seeing like, well, how can we better understand that? And how can we look about, look for ways to improve reading from screens? Because it's not going away. I mean, especially uh, these studies were done um, before COVID was even imagined. And now, I mean, every kid in the Grand Forks Public Schools has an iPad that they read from. And I think that's a great example of real, real world research. Um, you read something, it piques your interest, you ask a question. But in the real world, we have these questions because of, of you know, uh, new technologies, um, you know, moving from, you know, predominantly paper to predominantly screen, and you identify that and you're interested in it. So I think that's a really great way to help students understand, like, where do you get started? Well, you get started with an interest and you read something you want to say, like, I'd like to know more. So I really appreciate um, you sharing that. And our last question um, sure. of the day is going to be, um, what do you love about doing this type of research? We all, uh, I want students to, to feel the, the love that a lot of us get when we do our research. And so it might, but you know, I wanna know specifically from you, what do you love about doing experiment, you know, experimentational research? What do you love about doing quantitative? What do you love about your research? Mm -hmm. Well, what I particularly love about experimental research is it lets you really focus in on one component and understand how to optimize it. So yeah, the real world's very messy, right? So it's, I guess something has always compelled me to be like, well, there's always going to be all these complex systems and thought and things, and people are looking at those complex systems and they should, but what's one manageable piece of the educational experience that students have that I could take and I could look for ways to make it better in a way that can, you know, the idea is that you inch, you know, you make footsteps, you inch towards progress. There's, you know, no experimentalist that I know of thinks that they're going to solve all of the issues in education or anything like, to that effect. But it's like, well, if I could make, the reading instruction some kids are provided 
better for them or you know better because it's very rarely better for everybody it's just there's too much variation and what kids need and what adults need but what's that what's that one thing I can solidly hold on to examine contribute and know that um I put that uh, the the real rigorous testing out there so I can have confidence in saying this matters or in the case of the this study where paper and screens didn't matter I'd say you know maybe actually it didn't matter great um Virginia thank you so much I think that our students are going to really appreciate hearing from you uh hearing your words hearing your explanation um being able to read the work that you do and also you know what excites us about being education researchers so you know, hopefully they delve into more classes in education research because it is a lot of fun uh it's hard work but it's a lot of fun so I really appreciate your time today um thank you so much and um I'm really I'm hoping that uh, the students get a, a a great opportunity to have a chance to hear your voice and listen to your comments. So thank you again very much for your- Yeah, you're welcome. I was happy to talk with you.